It's August 18th, 2015, and um, for this lecture video, I wanted to uh, do some introductory uh, discussion. I'm kind of beginning uh, at the beginning, which is um, what are the psychedelic drugs and how are they best studied? So I'm going to try something new today, which involves PowerPoint slides um, interspersed with uh, the image of me talking. So let's see how this goes. Okay, let's begin with what to call these substances. Um, there are various considerations in naming them. Um, we can begin with the most basic uh, assumption, which is that they are physical, chemical substances. Uh, so once we've established that um, the different terms in use vary with regard to their scientific or popular use. Um, another factor to take into consideration is the <clears throat> uh, political or social implications uh, that are associated with the various terms. What is sometimes referred to as their baggage. This uh, is particularly the case with the term psychedelic. And most importantly, we want to make sure that the terms are accurate. Sorry for the glitch there. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, the most common terms include uh, the term psychedelic, which can be variously translated as mind uh, manifesting, mind disclosing, uh, more popular term recently, uh, which was developed in some ways to try to sidestep some of the social cultural baggage associated with psychedelic is entheogen, which um, variously translated means to generate the divinity from within. Um, another older term still in use is mind expanding or consciousness expanding. Uh, another uh, expression or term is psychointegrator. Um, Winkleman has done most of the work in explicating this term. The old medical legal term is hallucinogen which still uh, sees use primarily in the medical, legal, uh, psychopharmacology literature. Uh, Dave Nichols uh, developed um, the moniker of intactogen or empathogen, which um, generates the, well, it's a substance or a 
term expressing the notion that these substances improve empathy or contact with other objects, people, so on. And um, one of the older terms along with hallucinogen is psychotomimetic, and this term is still used within the uh, scientific, medical, and legal literature in Europe, primarily, that still sees some use in the U.S. So let's begin with psychedelic. Um, this uh, term was originally coined by Osmond and is a combination of both Greek and Latin roots, meaning mind disclosing or revealing or manifesting. Um, I think it's the most inclusive of uh, the terms we'll be discussing uh, because it can contain the um, possibility that nothing at all may happen or a lot may happen. It might be good or it might be bad. Uh, because it's the most, gen uh, the most generic and uh, nonspecific, it, uh, I think, is the most useful. Um, maybe uh, it would be good to uh, characterize, in a way, what the effects of a psychedelic drug are, at least a typical um, drug experience. Briefly, uh, the psychedelics um, modify every um, component of normal mental function, or mental function as we uh, normally experience it. Um, in our work with DMT, uh, based on uh, psychiatric and Buddhist mental status uh, theory and practice, uh, one could divide these mental functions into a handful of categories, uh, such as um, emotions, perceptions, thinking processes and content, physical or somatic feelings, a sense of control, uh, habitual tendencies, uh, responsiveness, interactions with the environment and oneself. Um, and uh, psychedelics may affect or affect um, any number of those um, functions uh, in a wide variety of uh, ways. Um, this is opposed to, let's say, the stimulants, which primarily affect energy um, and thinking, uh, you know, physical strength, but they're kind of one-dimensional as far as just stimulating, increasing the function uh, under consideration. On the sedatives um, are the opposite. They lower um, the functional activity of these uh, various mental categories. And uh, the psychedelics, on the other hand, are more broadly um, change and alter in a three-dimensional sort of space uh, these um, mental activities. <clears throat> so getting back to the term psychedelic, uh, one of the problems over the years with respect to using this term, especially as research has resumed and the drugs are less demonized by the media, is how to minimize this demonization uh, and reach as broad a demographic, uh, both uh, legislative, scientific, public as possible. And the scientific and the word psychedelic has accrued a lot of cultural baggage uh, over the generation, this last generation, uh, specifically related to the unrest 
associated with the 60s uh, in the, um, Viet the Vietnam War, the cultural, the, you know, the development of the counterculture, uh, free love, uh, hedonism taken to the ultimate, and so on. Um, the term that's being used popularly nowadays is entheogen, uh, which I will try to move this to a better orientation here, sorry. So this uh, assumes a certain belief in divinity or spirituality. Um, so it's not as broad um, a term as one might wish. Um, for example, would an atheist or radical materialist have an entheogenic experience if they didn't believe in God or spiritual, non-material, uh, mostly usually invisible level of reality? And would such a person even want to take an entheogen? Um, it would be against their grain in a lot of ways. I think the main problem is that it assumes the existence of a spiritual level of reality and also um, uh, is defined by a goal that not everyone attains. For example, not everyone, even if they uh, take an entheogen, would necessarily have an entheogenic effect. Um, they may not have any spiritual revelations. It may be completely mundane or purely personal, psychological uh, sort of uh, content. Um, another older term um, is mind expanding or consciousness expanding. Uh, this also is too restrictive in my mind because uh, one's mind or consciousness may contract rather than expand. Um, and like in theogen, it, is, it assumes uh, certain effects with an implied value. Uh, the same with the expression psychointegrator. Uh, this assumes that one will have certain effects with an implied value as well. Um, your mind becomes more integrated or your soul, body, and mind integrate with each other in a way that is both desirable uh, and uh, beneficial. But just as in the case of the mind expanding or entheogenic uh, terminology, uh, there are certain effects that are implied to be valuable and beneficial. Uh, which may or may not occur. In fact, just the opposite might take place. Uh, let's look at another term, the, probably the most common medical legal term, which is hallucinogen. Um, this is burdened with all kinds of problems. Uh, first of all, hallucinations um, are not invariant. People may have no uh, perceptual effects at all, and even if they do, um, these simply may be alterations or distortions or amplifications of uh, what's objectively real in the person's environment and wouldn't uh, at least classically 
meet the definition of a hallucination. Um, it also beggars the question, begs the question uh, of whether all the voices and the visions one experiences are hallucinations, which um, suggests or which implies that all such perceptual effects are unreal, um, generated by the mind, rather than being perceived by a mind that's capable of seeing into previously invisible realms. In other words, what is an hallucination? I think um, this needs to be looked at more carefully or the term used in a lot more specific uh, context. Um, it also uh, judges the state to be uh, pathological. Um, in other words, you're hallucinating uh, rather than seeing things either more clearly or seeing things that are rare and uh, usually not seen or heard. Intactogen or empathogen was coined by Dave Nichols in the context of the MDMA-like drugs, which are methamphetamine derivatives, not really classical psychedelics. So immediately we're limited to uh, looking at the non-classical drugs rather than the classical ones under consideration in most discussions such as LSD, DMT, psilocybin, mescaline. Um, so they also imply or suggest a particular response with implied value similar to the other terms that we've looked at. In other words, they uh, assume a particular uh, effect as the goal of the normative antactogen or empathogen experience, which people may or may not have. In fact, they may have just the opposite feeling, either cut off from themselves or from others, and almost anti-empathy or uh, emotional resonance kind of state. Um, the term that's often used in the European l literature and which was uh, more common in the American scientific medical legal literature in the 50s and the 60s was psychotomimetic, in other words, mimicking psychosis. Um, there was the belief after the discovery of LSD that this drug could uh, induce a temporary quote model unquote psychosis that could uh, provide a window into naturally occurring psychotic states. For example, the biology of LSD intoxication uh, could be looked at as a laboratory model for schizophrenia biology or things that prevented or blocked an LSD um, trip might help prevent or treat naturally occurring psychotic states like um, schizophrenia. But this also uh, is fraught with some difficulties uh, because it assumes that the psychedelic state is a psychotic state, uh, which, while there are some uh, phenomenological similarities, um, most people um, have uh, distinguished between uh, the two. Um, 
but more importantly, psychosis is an illness, and people don't take the psychedelic drug to become sick. Uh, they take them to become uh, healthier, or at least not to have a bad time generally, but to have a good time, to attain novel insights that they can put into practice in their daily lives, uh, solve creative problems, work on relationships, and the like. So primarily, the drawback with psychotomimetic is that it judges the state as only pathological. I mean, who would want to take a psychotomimetic? So I still prefer the term psychedelic. And as I've hammered this point home over the years, um, it seems that uh, there is at least um, a 50-50 balanced use of the term hallucinogen versus psychedelic, and perhaps even the majority of reports now, <clears throat> both in the media and in the scientific literature, use psychedelic rather than hallucinogen or hallucinogenic. Um, it, as I mentioned earlier, it uh, can be defined as mind disclosing or revealing or manifesting. It also captures the fact that uh, not much may happen, a lot may happen, might be good, might be bad, might increase empathy, might decrease empathy. Um, you might see things, you might not see things. Uh, I think as the next generation of researchers and the public let go of their various attachments to the 60s, um, the accrued cultural, uh, scientific, and other connotations also can drop away. Um, and although a term might have associated negative implications, um, sometimes it's still the best term. Uh, for example, the word love certainly has been misused over the millennia, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, we can't use it to express a particular uh, emotional, mental construct. So I think in the same way, if people object to the term psychedelic, uh, I think a good response is that it's the most accurate uh, term out there. So there are um, a number of um, fields on um, disciplines. Sorry for the screen moving in and out like that, um, which uh, might benefit from the uh, application of the psychedelic drug state uh, to them, as well as uh, contributing to our understanding of the full range of the psychedelic drug experience. In other words, fields that can inform and be informed by the psychedelic drug experience. These are what one might call applications. Um, the religious spiritual worlds, experiences, messages, and so on can be investigated. Uh, psychology, how the mind works, and psychotherapeutic implications. Uh, creativity, which was a field studied uh, only minimally during the first wave of human research with these drugs. Um, brain function, uh, such as uh, psychopharmacology, neurotheology, the brain biology of spirituality, um, the brain biology of psychosis, normal consciousness, uh, 
there's the use of psychedelics within the social, political, anthropological, and cultural milieus. Uh, for example, in uh, various cultures as agents that affect social relatedness, one's ideas about the ideal political state might emerge from a, uh, a focused application of the psychedelic drug state. Uh, and clearly, uh, cultural and aesthetic um, artistic uh, activities have been um, a major focus of the psychedelic drug experience. Uh, cosmology, too, as we'll discuss in a few minutes. So with respect to the religious or spiritual um, implications of the psychedelic drug state, we can use psychedelics uh, to explore the nature of invisible worlds. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of this approach or this particular uh, area is that of the beings encountered uh, in the DMT state, most commonly anyway in the DMT state, uh, sometimes found in other um, drug uh, effects such as salvinorin. Um, the invisible worlds contain information and some of that uh, information has to do with morality. In other words, learning how to relate to each other and the physical world in new ways. Um, a lot of religious experience uh, relates to the future, um, what may happen. And uh, this is the uh, traditional definition of the word prophecy, which uh, is a Greek um, word meaning to speak before something happens and relates to the Greek, the ancient Greeks use of divination in altered states as a way to predict the future. It's not necessarily my definition of prophecy, which I uh, discussed in a previous video, um, in which case the term more broadly refers to any spiritual experience recounted by any figure in the Old Testament. But uh, people do have experiences of predicting the future uh, in the psychedelic state, and this usually falls under the rubric of religious or spirituality uh, kinds of um, um, phenomena. Some people have uh, undergone what uh, could be deemed as a religious enlightenment experience vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Eastern Buddhist or Hindu uh, traditions. Um, the unitive mystical state of oneness or merging with the unborn, uncreated, undying, unchanging source of all um, reality. Um, many people are drawn to shamanism, especially the Latin American ayahuasca using version, um, in which case those experiences are contextualized as religious or spiritual ones. Uh, that is the beings and uh, the visions are uh, considered as real or more real than everyday reality. And in particular, those spiritual forces are, are applied uh, for various uh, ends, such as healing or harming, um, and so on. And uh, the prophetic state, which is more of an interactive relational type of spiritual experience 
in one sense in in uh, the in um, the fact that people maintain their individuality, relate and interact with the contents of their visions. Um, they're able to uh, direct their attention willfully, excuse me, willfully, and uh, remember uh, everything which has taken place. They can ask questions, receive answers, uh, those kinds of uh, more um, interactive uh, phenomena occurring within the religious or spiritual uh, realm. In the realm of psychology, the psychedelics uh, were utilized quite a bit in the 50s and the 60s, both from the psychotherapy point of view, uh, treating intractable illnesses such as addiction, substance abuse, uh, OCD, post-traumatic stress, autism, um, depression. And that's one of the major focuses of uh, the resurgence of clinical work. Right now, we're seeing uh, psilocybin in particular uh, being used for uh, the treatment of substance abuse or addictions like alcohol and tobacco. There was a study in Arizona using psilocybin for OCD. Um, and uh, the understanding of uh, one's, um, or the understanding of how the brain works, I mean, how the mind works, is given a great boost through the application of the psychedelic state. Um, for example, uh, how the mind associates various mental constructs um, with each other um, could be uh, understood better and applied better, uh, both in a uh, heuristic manner and also a therapeutic one. Uh, the creativity field was briefly studied at Stanford by Jim Fadiman, Willis Harmon, and their group uh, in the late 60s. Um, using or employing enrolling scientists, artists, and the like uh, to uh, work on particular problems uh, which had uh, resisted a uh, solution um, in their normal state of consciousness. Uh, and there were some promising results that have yet to be replicated. I think they're um, are some LSD studies underway now in the UK where LSD is being used to enhance creativity and perhaps in Switzerland with psilocybin, although I'm not certain of that. But uh, it's a logical uh, next step vis-a-vis um, -vis the, psilocy the uh, psilocybin work taking place in Zurich. Uh, there's a huge potential for psychedelics to let us know how the brain works better or a better understanding of how the brain works, both in normal and pathological states. Um, 
the old Saikato mimetic model, uh, while not necessarily being the most germane to the overall uh, denotation of these drugs, still has a great applicability uh, in understanding how uh, psychopathology may come to arise as a result of alterations in brain chemistry. Uh, if there are similarities, let's say, in the visions and the voices seen in schizophrenia with those uh, elicited by the administration of DMT, uh, then this would provide a window or a leverage point um, to understanding the possible role of a DMT-like substance uh, being involved in endogenous psychosis uh, and treatments to reduce, for example, a theoretical increase in that kind of um, activity of the, a DMT system or DMT-like system uh, may uh, provide some novel uh, insights into the pathology of psychosis and new treatments. Um, from a more of a uh, administration point of view, giving us a particular substance in order to provide a psychotherapeutic treatment, uh, there were some old LSD data from the 50s and early 60s giving a low dose of LSD every day for depression, and this uh, showed some early promise, and there are a lot of uh, studies now demonstrating that acute administration of ketamine relieves depression quite quickly, and also some uh, data from Brazil indicating the same for ayahuasca. Um, the social, political, anthropological, cultural kinds of issues uh, that relate to the psychedelic state include uh, a number of less perhaps scientifically studyable, um, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean that qualitative research uh, couldn't be done, at least in the beginning. And this has to do with notions of personal identity. Uh, is one an individual or simply a member of a communal collective, uh, community welfare, uh, such as uh, the issues of wealth distribution, charity, health care, uh, those kinds of things which are all affected by uh, one's sense of self and other that are modified under the influence of a psychedelic drug. And at a larger level, conceptually, the ideal state, be it monarchy, fascism, communism, democracy, um, etc., that might be seen under a new light um, during the psychedelic drug state, perhaps being uh, useful uh, as a uh, for providing a new perspective um, on the ideal political state. For example, Maimonides, and after him, Leo Strauss. Um, based a lot of their political theory on the prophetic message contained uh, in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. So this is an example of how uh, a political model devolves from a spiritual experience. Um, from a cosmological point of view, this is more fanciful, but nevertheless, it's one of my pet projects, at least conceptually or speculatively, is uh, what is the nature of uh, the DMT world? Um, is it a hallucination? 
Um, is it a brain aberration or is it the perception of an objective external freestanding reality? If it were uh, the perception of an external reality, where does that reside? So uh, this leads to um, ideas regarding uh, usually invisible worlds that contemporary physics is addressing, peering into, as it were, uh, the primary candidates being dark matter and parallel universes, which then leads to the uh, idea of a dark matter uh, camera uh, that might capture images of the contents and or inhabitants of dark matter, which if they look like the DMT beings would uh, go a long way to validate their, um, their reality. At the same time, it may be that uh, a living human uh, consciousness is necessary to interact uh, with dark matter under the influence of a psychedelic drug, in which case a machine uh, may not quite be capable uh, of returning with images of what is contained there. Uh, in summary, then, uh, as far as the terminology goes, I like the word psychedelic. I think it's the most accurate and the most all-inclusive, although it does have baggage, uh, but this baggage seems to be uh, being shed, particularly with this new generation of psychedelic research taking place. And uh, there are many fields uh, that could benefit from uh, the psychedelic drug experience and ones that could be applied to the psychedelic drug effect um, in order to uh, flesh out as fully as possible the nature of and integration of the psychedelic drug state um, into uh, our everyday lives and the larger um, culture and uh, physical world. <laughs>